Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in just a few moments. All right, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our virtual event this evening, where we'll be in conversation with Juliana Branham, uh, who is the director of the documentary film LaDonna Harris, Indian 101. My name is Gwendolyn Fernandez. I'm the curator of education and public programs here at the Harwood Museum of Art, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. So thank you so much for tuning in um, as we learn more about this remarkable film and the story of the return of Blue Lake to Taos Pueblo. Before I turn things over to our moderators from True Kids One, just wanna share a few Zoom housekeeping notes uh, as well as program announcements. Um, so first of all, tonight's event is part of our programming around the exhibition commemorating the 50th anniversary of the return of Blue Lake to Taos Pueblo, A New Day for American Indians. It's on view at the Harwood Museum of Art through this Sunday, April 17th. So you have just a few more days to come see the exhibition in person if you have not done so already. Also, you can still view uh, the film one more day that will be available for on-demand screenings via the Harwood's website. I'll drop a link in the chat if you haven't yet had a chance to see the film, please do. Tonight's program will run approximately one hour uh, and we are recording this program. So we will share it via the Harwoods YouTube channel as well as the True Kids One uh, YouTube channels. We welcome your questions throughout the evening. Please use the Q&A function in the Zoom chat, or excuse me, the Q&A function in your Zoom uh, rather than the chat. That's where we will be looking for questions. You can use the chat to share links, say hello, that kind of thing, but please do put any questions uh, for our speakers tonight in the Q&A. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to our moderators this evening from True Kids One. We have Isabella O'Donnell Silferberg, a senior at Taos High School, and Amaria Manuelto, who is a freshman at Vista Grande High School. They are both active participants in the True Kids One Democracy Project, which most recently covered the inauguration of Taos's new mayor and our two new council members, and a second interview of Senator Bobby Gonzalez. So I'll hand things over to you, Amaria and Isabella. Welcome everyone. My name is Amari Melito and I'm thrilled you joined us here tonight. Joining us is Juliana Branham. She is a documentary filmmaker based in Austin, Texas. She was the producer of the independent lens documentary Conscience Point airing nationally on PBS and served as series producer on the 2018 Emmy nominated PBS series Native America. Juliana is a graduate of the University of Oklahoma and is a citizen of the Quata Band of the Comanche Nation of Oklahoma. And of course, she directed and produced a documentary that is the subject of today's live stream, LaDonna Harris in Indian 101, for which she won fellowships from the Sundance Institute, Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the Tribeca Film Institute. Good evening, Juliana. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I'm Isabella O'Donnell Soferberg, and also joining us is Vernon Lujan, the Deputy Tribal Programs Administrator at Taos Pueblo and the Curator of Commemorating the 50th Anniversary of the Return of Blue Lake to Taos Pueblo, A New Day for American Indians, on view at the Harwood Museum of Art through April 17th. Vernon served as the director of the Powake Poem Museum and held positions at the Institute of American Indian Arts and the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. He is a writer and contributed an essay about Taos Pueblo to Taos, a topical history, published by Museum of New Mexico Press. 
He earned his master's in public administration with focus on American Indian studies from UNM. Good evening, Vernon. Good evening, Good evening everybody. Sorry about that. I'm getting used to the buttons here. No worries. We're happy to have you. Juliana, tell us a little about how this film project came to be. Um, well, I was working on um, uh, Stanley Nelson's um, film about Wounded Knee, 1973. And at that time, um, I was getting in just the most incredible um, footage from the 60s and 70s that, you know, this is this is also pre kind of, um, uh, you know, now we have so much more access to archival material, but back then, you know, you really had to dig for it and and dig through some things. And we were getting in lots of tapes from all these different television networks. And every now and then I would see LaDonna pop in um, in some news stories. And um, I was thinking about what I was going to do next for myself. This was because I was working for somebody else. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm uh, LaDonna is my great aunt. And, you know, she, I've always known of her and known of her work, but I guess I didn't realize at the time how influential she was um, in this time period in the 60s and 70s. And so um, I thought this would be an interesting, this could be an interesting documentary. And so I reached out to her and and uh, we just kind of, you know, started talking about the possibility of doing something. And her daughter, Laura, and um, her daughter, Catherine, were very excited about the idea of making a documentary about her. It's something they'd always wanted uh, to do. And so, so yeah, we, we just decided this is going to be, this is going to be our new journey. And <laughs> we, we all kind of just uh, hopped on and I was able to find um, funding um, uh, you know, somewhat easily at first. And then as the years went on, it became more difficult um, because funding was just so limited for, for documentaries. But um, um, so, so yeah, that's kind of how, how that all came to be. And um, Vernon, will you tell us a little bit about how this film relates to the current exhibit that's on display at the Harwood? Yes. Um, well, I know Donna personally and Senator Harris, her husband. I uh, served uh, two internships with them when they were in Albuquerque, and she is currently uh, executive director of Americans for Indian Opportunity. Um, but before that, she was uh, she had started Oklahomans for Indian Opportunity, and she had also served on a national council that was established by um, I think it was Johnson. Um, it was called the National Council for Indian Opportunity. So um, her focus has always been Indian Opportunity, as you can tell. Um, but the reason. I wanted to showcase this um, movie or documentary by Ms. Branham was that there is a segment on Blue Lake in the documentary. Um, LaDonna and Fred Harris, when they moved to Washington in the mid late sixties, uh, when he became Senator for Oklahoma, um, basically made her one of the few Native Americans in Washington at that time coming from a, from a um, reservation or a um, Indian community. So they had like a, um, I would say like a rude awakening because a lot of congressional people didn't know about Indians. They, they, what they knew they probably read in a book or they had any constituents in their, um, States, they, they didn't know them all that well, but um, LaDonna made it a point to educate the con congressmen and women about Indians. And that's why I, I figured that the film that was called Indian 101, because it was basically an introduction to Native Americans. And um, she did a wonderful job because 
she really did educate these people about Native Americans and Indians in general, and more specifically, um, her and her husband, Senator Harris, also joined our struggle to get our land back here at Taos Pueblo. So they had, they hosted parties, um, Senator Harris had meetings and hearings in the committees that he was on and he ran. And he basically uh, took on Clinton P. Anderson, who was also a senator from New Mexico. And I like that one line in Ms. Brennan's film where she, um, in an interview, um, Senator Harris said that Senator Anderson was so angry at him that he finally called him out on the table and told Senator Harris, I don't mess with your Indians, don't mess with mine. Like we were a possession, that was kind of rude, I thought. And, but that was the prevailing attitude at that time was, um, you know, what's mine is mine, what's yours is yours. And basically there was an old, old boy system where they did favors for each other and that's how legislation was passed. Well, what happened during that time was Clinton Anderson was using his position on, on influential committees, Indian Affairs and Finance and other committees to block the return of our land to our people. So he did everything in his power to do that. And Senator Harris and a few other senators, Edward Kennedy and um, uh, I think it was Stuart Udall and a bunch of other people uh, joined forces and they broke that old boy system. They using using their um, positions on some committees and also just talking with people like Ms. Harris is well known for. She has, is very charming. She's she's um, a beautiful lady and she just has a presence and that was what people loved about her in Washington and anywhere else in the, in the world. You know, the fact that she's down to earth and she can really talk to people about issues and bring them to the forefront. And that's what her and her husband did, Sandra Harris. And they influenced people to um, see that there was everything right about returning our land to Taos Pueblo. And so we are ever, uh, grateful to them for that, and uh, that's why I wanted this film to be part of this exhibit because basically Ms. Branham did a wonderful job in incorporating that in a subtle way, you know, it was all a part of the, the whole theme about uh, educating Congress in Washington about Indians and Indian 101. Thank you. Juliana, what are a few things about LaDonna Harris that you find to be fascinating? What kind of person is she? Well, just as Vernon said, I think, and what makes her, you know, truly who, what made her very unique in, in Washington was um, she had a combination of kind of personality traits that, um, that that people love and whether it was a democrat or republican she was able to kind of get her her footing in either party and and recruit people to support some of her um her initiatives and it was you know it's funny it's it's you i you know i aspire to be like her but it's it's really just sort of an ingrained personality you know traits like i said that you know, she's, um, she's very kind, she's very thoughtful, she's listening to you. So when you're, when somebody's speaking, she's really listening. And I think that's what a lot of people um, uh, don't, they don't do that, especially in Washington, because they're just there to get out their own, you know, their own agenda and, and not really take into consideration other people's, you know, um, um, thoughts and, and motivations. And so I think she, being a really good listener uh, which she said that she had always been as a young girl. Um, she suffered a learning disability. And so she would was much more attuned to listening 
because she couldn't read as well with dyslexia. And so I think, and, you know, when she was young, she talked about how she would always listen to the elders to listen, you know, what they were saying and what was going on, uh, whereas most children don't really do that typically. And so I think that ability and the ability to just be, you know, charming and funny and she's approachable, super approachable. I think, you know, her being married to a non-native man, I think was probably helped like that, that there was that buffer that, 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 you know, she seemed more approachable than your average, you know, person. So I think, um, I, yeah, I just think it's just, she has a really wonderful, um, you know, um, wonderful personality traits that makes, uh, makes people just love you, love her and, and you're drawn to her and you want to do anything she needs you to do. <laughs> so, um, it's just, this, it's just this rare combination of really, you know, she's good people and people catch on to that. And that's how she was able to have so much political weight without, even going to college, is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, and when you look at, you know, specifically when you're talking about the Taos Blue, Blue Lake, I think, um, um, yeah, there were senators like the the one you mentioned who tells Fred, you know, don't don't mess with my Indians and I won't mess with yours. Um, there was definitely a lot of that, but um, you know, I think she was able to, with you know, and with her partnership with with Fred. Um, really just was able to kind of crack that, 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 you know, crack that code of, of how to break in and, and sort of be like, make bipartisan, um, uh, you know, initiatives. And she was able to do that. And that's what always kind of drew me the most, I thought was really interesting, because we are so partisan in our governments now, and our political parties that we just won't hear anything outside of what we what we want to hear. And, um, so many programs, not just the Tals Return of the Tals Blue Lake, but so many of those um, programs that she she rallied behind, um, she was able to get, you know, access to both parties, to all parties, to to kind of get on board. Um, and I think um, I think, you know, being able to do that with a land return that's a huge deal. Um, and this being probably one of the first if not the first land return that the government has ever given. I know there was another one after Taos Blue Lake um, in Washington. Um, uh, there was a mountain sacred site that was given back to the Yakima. But this was, you know, these were really the first, the first movement in, in that um, land, this idea of land return. And so, yeah, she was very pivotal in trying to just garner, you know, they were going to all these different you know, people that they had and allies that they had and then and really working, um, you know, sort of a plan to kind of bring everybody together for this. And, you know, that's, as we all know from watching the news, especially lately, that's a very hard task. So I commend her for that. Yeah, getting people organize, organized enough around a good cause to actually get something done. Yeah. Um, Vernon, you briefly mentioned your relationship with LaDonna and Fred. Will you speak about that a little bit? Tell us, tell us about what kind of people you saw them as. Well, as Ms. Branham said, they're very friendly, outgoing, personable, charming, uh, knowledgeable people. And, you know, they're easy to talk to and, and they listen. And I was a young man, um, like my freshman and sophomore and sophomore years in college. So uh, very impressionable. And as Ms. Branham said, I wanted to be like them and I wanted to do whatever they, they asked me to do because uh, I was working for them, uh, number one, but I was also learning from them. Um, I was seeing not just as an intern, but as a fortunate person to be there working for them um, with Americans for Indian Opportunity. We, there was a lot of big issues going on at the time. There was the, uh, the Council of Energy Resource Tribes had just been formulated to protect the natural resources of, of the tribes because there was a lot of coal mining and timber harvesting among the tribes. and. 
these tribes were were basically getting cheated out of their resources and, and getting very few um, um, returns for their for the and the resources that were being extracted from their reservations. Uh, and the, I remember, I remember the film says that they were only getting dollars on the on the return of some of the minerals and timber and that was crazy because the companies like Weyerhaeuser and Peabody, these big companies were making millions of dollars on the resources and they're paying the tribes, oh, you know, a thousand here, a thousand there for those resources. So we did stuff like that. We were um, uh, helping tribes um, with uh, self-governance, the Indian Self-Determination and Educational Assistance Act was also passed at that time, uh, shortly after Blue Lake was returned. And uh, as Ms. Branham mentioned, it was basically a, um, it kind of opened the, opened the floodgates for some of this legislation that, that was important for American Indian people at that time like the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, and the, like I said, the Indian Self-Determination Act, and there was others um, like that, that were uh, key legislation that our people could use to, um, to protect our resources and to advance our, our people into um, the 20, 21st century. There was the, um, Economic Development Act, which had special provisions for Native Americans. And uh, there was the National Historic Preservation Act, which helped us to preserve a lot of our, our culture. And the Archaeological Resource Protection Act helped us to protect some of our ancient sites like uh, Mesa Verde and um, Chaco Canyon, uh, places like that. So um, we were involved in that. And I remember working really hard to research various issues that were affecting Native Americans at that time. And that, that's what um, Donna and Fred were all about with Americans for Indian Opportunity. They were there to help people connect with um, these powerful legislators so that they could advance the causes for their people. Yeah, and I think I think Ladonna like kind of served um, um, as a conduit to to you know actual real concrete legislation change because I you know at the time this is the most pivotal time probably in, in American Indian history 60s and 70s when things are kind of switching we're we're getting real you know movement to reverse some of the policies um, that were forced upon us and. You know, there was a lot of um, real radical groups, um, you know, protest groups, um, very similar to what we see today. But they didn't have that contact with the actual legislators, and they were often seen as troublemakers, and they were, you know, could easily alienate people in a community um, because of their tactics being very, you know, you know, radical American Indian movement, um, that kind of thing. And so I think with, um, you know, they would call on her anytime they were in DC and be like, you know, can you help us to meet with some so-and-so or, or this, or if they ended up getting in themselves into a pickle, she would, she would do her, but they would call on her. So she was one of the very few native people in Washington DC that had that, um, access. Um, and, you know, you have to remember too, at this time, not only she, she was a woman, but she, she didn't have a college education. Um, and so that was, was a really big deal for, um, for, you know, position that she was in, you know, to be in. Um, and it, like she said, she feels like she went to call, they went to college rather than just Fred going to college. They went to college together even though she was paying for him to go to school. And, you know, she told me things that really blew my mind um, as I'm, you know, a couple generations younger than her, but for instance, that women couldn't, couldn't climb up the corporate ladder because they weren't allowed to travel and go to, to, to uh, conferences. And I just thought, wow, you know, that's, that's wild. That, that was seen as like very taboo for a woman to, 
be traveling with men or, you know, even to take the bus somewhere or, you know, to travel alone, like that wasn't a thing. And so of course you're not going to be able to grow in your field of expertise if you're not, you know, going out to, you know, different events and learning more um, from your peers and, and that kind of thing. So it was like really kind of basic, basic um, uh, rights that women did not have that she was kind of having to go through all of those, um, you know, these points in history. So, and, and also she was very active in women's rights um, period on, on, you know, lots of different, um, you know, in terms of equal pay, um, uh, you know, daycare for working mothers and that kind of thing. So she was very, um, she had a lot of, a lot of areas that she was, uh, you know, really uh, focused on not just native uh, um, issues, but also other, you know, poverty and education and that kind of thing. So, so yeah, she was, she's very remarkable. Yeah. When I told my family about this interview, my grandfather bought a blue lake and told me how important the entire community of Tauspolo was in bringing it back. And indeed, the return of Blue Lake to Taos Pueblo was the first time the United States government gave land back to a native to Native American tribe. Juliana, Juliana, can you tell us more about the significance of this moment in history and how it relates to today? Sure. Um, Vernon should also chime in um, since he's he's very knowledgeable of the history of how Blue Lake. Um, uh, was taken in the first place. Um, but from my understanding through LaDonna and Fred and why I chose this <clears throat> particular event um, to focus on in the film was because um, it was a first and it was just a first you know, time where legislation was kind of reversed and, and land was given back. But it was like, I mean, that concept of land back that we're talking about now that seems like a pipe dream actually happened for somebody. And it took a ton of work and it was a lot of people, a lot of, um, you know, working with different committees and to garner that support. Um, it was President Nixon who, you know, obviously Fred Harris probably wasn't a big fan of, but they found that President Nixon had, um, a football coach who was Cherokee and he was very close to him and he had always known he always thought it was very sad that he couldn't become this football uh, uh, a big you know star football coach because he thought he was so great but because he was he was a native person so he always had a soft spot in his heart but you know nobody knew that until until much later when they learned that this is like oh okay so he had a he had this president who's kind of known to not be the greatest president had this soft spot in his heart to uh, for Native people. And, you know, had it not been for LaDonna working with uh, the Tas Pueblo and, and getting them a platform, you know, th never, this never would have, this historic moment never would have happened. Um, and like I said, it has led to, soon after that, it was another sacred site that was returned. Um, in Washington to the Yakima. And um, since then there's been a series of, of, of um, land return. And that goes from like cities and counties to private individuals returning lands. Um, um, a Methodist church, the you know, uh, United Methodist Church returned land um, to, to a tribe. And it just, you know, once you start real, once these kind of things start gaining momentum, I think there's opportunity for some real, um, real concrete returns happening. So um, I don't think it's a pipe dream anymore. I don't think land back is a pipe dream. And, and looking back at LaDonna and Fred and, and all the people that worked, it wasn't just them. It was a, it was a, a, a big group of, of folks, but that helped return the, the Blue Lake. But, you know, when you look back on that uh, being the very first, uh, what a pivotal, pivotal time in history. And like Vernon said, it also, right after that is when things really started gaining momentum in terms of, um, you know, just tribal sovereignty in general and um, Indian self-determination uh, self -determination act and, and that kind of thing. But, um, but Vernon, do you have anything else to add? Well, 
the history of U.S. American Indian and Native relations was such up until this point, as Ms. Branham said, that this was a turning point because previous to this, all the legislation that was proposed by Congress and at various administrations up to this point were basically as geared towards either termination or assimilation and taking back, taking our land away from us. Um, that whole trail of tears thing with the Cherokees, uh, you know, that was all the, the push of new immigrants to the country pushing westward and re, re, um, removing native people from their homelands. And either it was either forcibly or involuntarily, but it was um, basically um, congressional and um, um, presidential executive and um, it was also um, judicial because they made a lot of laws that were geared towards um, taking away our land and then only giving us uh, what what they thought we needed. Like the when they were removing tribes from the east, they they des designated Oklahoma as Indian territory, and it was a lar much larger than Oklahoma is now. It, was, it included uh, Missouri and Arkansas and some of those states, but then it slowly got whittled away down to what it is now, what Oklahoma is now. And then they started um, uh, legislating laws like allotment. The Allotment Act basically uh, took all that land away in Oklahoma and elsewhere, and they um, gave us 100 or 80 acres if you were single and 160 if you were married couple with a family and, and with those acreage they expected you to be able to be self-sufficient you know to become far um juliana yeah better suited for grazing or you know stuff like that so basically it was a kind of a do or die situation so um then there was termination uh, in the 50s and there was relocation in the 60s uh, i myself and i don't know if juliana was of that um generation but my parents moved us to uh, california uh, with the promise that they were going to get educations and jobs. So when we moved, uh, my father went to school at um, San Francisco State College. And then um, he soon after worked for um, Boeing Airlines. But when we first moved, they basically, BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, made all these promises about helping us to relocate to this big city uh, at a which was first Oakland. They moved us to Oakland, they put us in this apartment, and then we didn't see them for like months or even a year. So basically our family just struggled. Uh, they did help my father get into school. So he went to school and my mother had to fend for herself and my brother and I. So she ended up getting a job just like Madonna and Fred, Senator Fred Harris, she put him through school. So did my mother. So she put my father through school uh, with her job and raised my, my brother and I. And there was these programs that were geared towards assimilating people, Indian people at that time, which was this relocation program, which was on the one hand better than being terminated or not being recognized as a native person at all, you know, given taking away all those rights. Uh, and like I said, and as Branham said, this uh, windfall of new legislation that was passed after Blue Lake uh, included the Indian Civil Rights Act. 
because uh, as Ms. Brennan mentioned, there's a lot of, uh, um, how would I say, um, people that were not happy with how they were being treated. Uh, African-Americans, Hispanics, you know, people of color basically were being treated poorly. Uh, you saw in the film that there was, um, there's places at that time where blacks only were supposed to be segregated. So they had to go to these different places in the same building as, as whites. Like if you went to a movie, you had a little section. Well, basically that's how they treated Native Americans as well. We, we had uh, places that we were forbidden to go. So uh, it was the same thing. And as Ms. Branham said, there were movements like AIM, American Indian Movement, who were pretty radical. Uh, it was a pretty radical way of trying to affect change. But I think that Mrs. Harris's way of affecting change was just as uh, radical and it was more um, successful. Yeah, there was a real, um, a real show for what she did, which was the return of Blue Lake to Taos Pueblo. Um, and this is a question, this could be for either you, Juliana, or you, Vernon. Um, but do you know of any other specific instances of land being given back to native people? Do you know if it's, how, how frequently does it happen? Is it common or has it not happened for a while or what does it look like today? I feel like it's becoming more common. I mean, I think throughout the 2000s, there were, um, you know, small parcels of land here and there that different, um, you know, either organizations or cities um, um, are giving back and I, I do, um, I do hear about um, uh, individuals or, um, you know, people just, you know, neighborhoods and cities or, um, you know, something that might have some, some significance um, that people are, are doing that pretty regularly. More often now we have this land back movement. It's an actual movement to, you know, to start talking about that and creating these um, relationships in order to, to, to get some of those things, or some of those um, tracts of land returned back to individual tribes. And um, I know that there's also tribal buyback programs that a lot of tribes are using their economic and, you know, um, um, you know, they're, they're, they're using their own funds to purchase uh, lands that are significant to them. Um, there was something recently, um, uh, Ashton Tuckett. Yeah, the, was it that the mash? Yeah, in, in uh, Connecticut or somewhere up there, uh, Massachusetts, they they were, were finally uh, recognized, federally recognized, and it took a while longer for them to get their land back, but they got some land back. And the uh, Department of Interior has a program. It's called the uh, buyback program. Tribes, they they help tribes buy back the their land or, you know, land that's adjacent to their reservation so that um, the tribe, you know, some tribes don't have a lot of money. Um, they, they supplement that, that funding that they do have to buy the land back. Right. It's called, you know, the land back buyback program. But um, the, the fact of the matter is that we lost millions of acres. I mean, we lost the whole country. And um, there's no way we're going to get all of it back. But uh, the tribes are using their sovereignty. They're using their um, casino and other economic development revenue to buy back land or um, build homes for their, their tribal members. And this is all as a result of what happened in the early and mid-70s and 80s. When all this legislation was passed recognizing uh, American Indian sovereignty and the right to tribal self-government. Another, another thing recently that happened is that the Na National Bison Range, which was run by um, the U.S. Wildlife um, and Fish uh, 
uh, department uh, gave the land, well, not technically gave the land, but they gave the management rights to the land to the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. And I think that was a huge, um, uh, a huge step forward because this bison range, it's a bison range and they had, and it's on their own, it's on their lands, um, but it was made into a national, you know, park to keep the bison, um, you know, at least protected in that area. But that those tribes um, had been asking for decades to allow them to manage that. There's no reason why the U.S. government should be managing it when the tribes, it's their, it was their land, they're more familiar with it in terms of environmental, um, you know, protection, um, and they were the stewards of the land in the first place. So that was a big return, because I think that was like 18,000 acres or 20,000 acres of land that they are going to be managing now. Um, um, and then, of course, there's the McGirt Supreme Court decision. This isn't necessarily land back, I mean, it could be, I guess, considered land back, but um, that happened in Oklahoma where they determined that half of the state of Oklahoma had actually, the reservations had never been dissolved. So half of the state of Oklahoma is now, is now reservations, which means that any native person on those tribal lands that is charged with a crime can go through the federal and tribal courts rather than state court. Um, so that was really interesting. I, I'm not a, an expert on it, so I don't know all the repercussions of what that means, but that's probably the biggest event <laughs> in history that they just realized that this land is not actually a state, a part of the state, it's, it's sovereign tribal nations. So we'll see in the coming years what what that does and what that looks like to change um, for the tribes of Oklahoma, but but that was a, a big one. Yeah, and have either of you seen or heard of any push within local, state, or national government to um, give land back to Native people without them having to buy it with their own money? Um, I mean, I don't I don't know exactly, you know, what this what you know states are considering that um you know in a in a real you know concrete way um meaningful way but um you know it it seems to be happening in small pockets in all over the country you know small maybe smaller things and um, i think when you start thinking about bigger like land return i don't know that that's actually totally possible but <laughs> um you know, but but as long as we're moving in the right direction, I think we are, um, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. um, not so much states are involved in that type of um, process of returning land. I wish they would, but uh, there's been individuals and like um, small trust uh, foundations that are, that are giving land back to uh, Native peoples or donating it back. Uh, I know here in Taos, the Taos Land Trust uh, acquired some um, land just south of, of uh, Taos. And on that land, it is significant to Taos Pueblo because we still make pilgrimages to the hot springs that are there on that land. So Taos Land Trust obtained the land because it was owned privately. And when the owners passed away, they left it to the Taos Land Trust. And then the Taos Land Trust turned around and they gave donated it to the Pueblo. So now it's ours in perpetuity. And uh, so we're charged with maintaining it. We have, there was already a fence there. So we maintain the fence and we clean the hot springs and um, people still sneak in there to use it. But that's mainly for ceremonial purposes. We, we go and retrieve the water from there and use it in our ceremonies. We don't necessarily bathe in it, but um, just things like that. There's also like the uh, National Historic Preservation Act has a section 106 in that legislation, which mandates that federal and state agencies have to consult with Indian tribes on all matters that affect uh, 
traditional cultural properties they're called. So when an uh, individual or the state or uh, a company or corporation want to do any kind of development of land, deals with land, they have to consult with a tribe that's nearby. Like here in Taos, you know, that big uh, road project that's going through the town of Taos? Well, uh, they, this New Mexico Department of Transportation had to consult with Taos Pueblo to make sure that they weren't infringing on any traditional or cultural uh, uses of that land. And um, also just recently, the uh, Bandelier National Monument, you know, just south of uh, Los Alamos, they entered into agreement with uh, Santa Clara Pueblo so that Santa Clara Pueblo is basically a partner in how the uh, Bandelier is managed from here on in. So there's those kinds of initiatives now between tribes and um, state federal agencies. Yeah, and since um, since Blue Lake was kind of the first real big example of that happening, and Ladonna Harris was a big part of that, um, it's really cool that the Harwood exhibit and the movie both contain so much archival material um, surrounding that moment in history. So what, for Juliana, what was the research process like to get all of that material and be able to include it in the film? Um, I, I love archival. It's my, I mean, it's, I love photographs um, and archival of older, old films. Like I love to just stick through and, you know, you just really get an, a better understanding of history um, when you, when you, you know, again, immerse yourself in that. Um, and, uh, you know, this was also a very fun era to, <laughs> to, to research too, in terms of, well, my interest, it's fun for me to learn more about, um, you know, this, this, it's more of a recent history, um, and especially one that a family member, you know, of mine was involved in, um, and seeing her, you know, on these old cult shows, like, you know, um, just it was just fun it was just fun to kind of dig in and I you know went to all these different libraries and and museums to find some of the stuff I I ended up unearthing um some footage from the we shall remain uh series that I was working on um we were looking for some boarding school footage uh, early boarding school footage and there's a ton of photographs but I happened to come across this is, you know, a long time before things became really digitized and you can find this stuff now online pretty easily. This was, you know, what, uh, 15 years ago or so. So not, not everything was digitized. So you have to actually go there and look stuff or have somebody go there and, and look it up and, and tell you what's on it. And then they make you a VHS tape and send it to you. But, but I found this footage at the University of North Carolina that had not even been opened um, since it was made. And so the archive, by the description of it, I knew that it was something we wanted. And so I went ahead and had the archive transfer that material from 16 millimeter film uh, to video. And when we saw it, it was it's the most shocking and it's the footage in the, in the movie um, that you see um, in Indian 101, but it's uh, uh, some Indian kids, you know, uh, the before, and kind of after images. This is what the Navajo students look like when they arrive. And here they're all white and pristine and their hair is cut and you know, boys have no braids and they all look you know, nice and shiny. And, and then they have them singing uh, you know, 10 little Indians. And every and I watch that, I just start crying. I just thought, oh, this is this is the most this is the, you know so sad and, and it was heartbreaking and but now now that we got that film we paid to get that film digitized now you see it around a little bit more um because it's just it's just powerful stuff um so yeah to answer your question um archival is it's it's just it's a fun little you know hunt hunt for like a scavenger hunt and <laughs> try to find these nuggets and find the stuff that hasn't yet been digitized and and um you know, get it out uh, and see that again with fresh eyes. It's just, it's just really, it's really fun. Yeah, absolutely. It's really important to bring to light what's been buried in archives for hundreds mm -hmm. of years. Yeah, and it helps to contextualize everything too. 
Um, um, so yeah, it's just it's just really good to have that kind of support material. I mean, I think when you're when you're looking to make a film, you have to take that a documentary anyway, and it's a historical. You have to take that consideration because if you don't have any archival materials, then what? And you're just going to have interviews back to back, talking heads, and um, so that was you know, like I said, that was one of my inspirations for making this about Ladonna. I was like, oh, there's actually a lot of stuff. She wasn't just sitting behind a desk you know, and, and I'm going to read off all her accomplishments. It's like there's actual supporting material to show her, to show the viewer what she's like and what she was doing and, you know, and then just get set sort of, you know, the tone of that time in Washington. Um, you know, they talk a lot about having parties and that was one of LaDonna's like, you know, strategies to get people because everybody felt they had to go to a party, you know, they have FOMO, fear of missing out or whatever, if they didn't go, because there could be any, you know, celebrity there, there could be somebody important that they want to meet. And so it would get everyone. Then I liked that she would also invite the lowest level, like the interns were even invited. So you get the highest level and the lowest level of, you know, your office and the staff. But you know what, those interns are the ones that are going to be paying your paycheck at some point. So <laughs> best to keep them in good graces too, you know? And so I think she saw that and, you know, used that as like, okay, let's get them to a party, give them a couple of drinks, have a casual conversation about your issue. And, you know, you just, you know, you start building on those relationships. And that's what she was really good at. I remember her saying too, that she didn't like to, um, you know, the other, the wives of the other uh, senators uh, would just do tea parties and invite each other to tea parties and they would like, you know, fold these bandages for, you know, the, you know, for the people in Vietnam and, and they would just do the, you know, tea parties amongst themselves and she was like, no way, <laughs> this doesn't interest me in the least, I want to go out and do something and make a change and you know, I don't want to be folding bandages. Like I have much more to give to, you know, I've got to teach these people <laughs> about Indian 101 because they don't even know the basics and they're making massive, massively important decisions without having any knowledge or any background or any way to contextualize what the issue is. So, yeah. Julia. Uh, make a correction. Yeah. The tribe that was recently given back their land was the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe. Yes, Mashpee. Yeah. Mashpee, not, yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you for the correction. This is the last question. Um, Juliana, from your perspective as an indigenous woman, what is it like making a career in the film and media industry? What have you seen change? What do you want to see change more? Well, you know, this, um, the last couple of years has been a whirlwind of really um, meaningful change in the film industry for filmmakers of color and for women. Um, I would say up until just a couple of years ago, there were virtually no opportunities um, for our stories. And I remember 10, 15 years ago, pitching different native stories to executives at HBO or uh, Netflix or whomever and Hulu had just started and like, you know, talking to them about projects and they say, oh, well, that's really interesting. But yeah, well, we don't, we're, we can't do that because it's just not really, there's no audience for it. Because we had no proof that there was an audience. We had no proof that people were going to actually watch this and make, you know, watch these films. And, and so really our only, you know, home was film festivals and PBS because they actually did care. Um, and, you know, I think it's a series of events that happened over those last couple of years. I often put a lot of it towards uh, Black Lives Matter and people paying more attention to, um, uh, you know, people of color and sort of the issues that we have faced. But I think also, you know, the Me Too movement had a big uh, change. I think social media is a huge you know way to influence people and like it's like when you saw you know reservation dogs that came out in the success that and the attention and every newspaper is covering it i think every newspaper was a magazine was like so excited to, or they felt like they had to you know we gotta it's a big bandwagon we gotta jump on too so we don't look stupid you know and 
you know, the coverage was incredible. And not only that, it was the, the audience support on social media was incredible. And suddenly now, you know, networks are calling everybody. Like I can't even find native crew anymore to, <laughs> to work. So now we need to focus on programs to train, you know, younger people in the various, you know, um, areas because we just don't have enough. We don't have enough now um, because everybody's busy and working, which is a really wonderful thing, but it just, everything seemed to change quickly. It's like, now there's financing, now there's interest, now there's networks saying, hey, we wanna do something on, oh, oh I, also a huge influence um, on all of this uh, was the Dakota Access Pipeline protests, huge. That was the first time I feel like, and I've, and I've really studied a lot of these, you know, sort of uh, kind of monumental events in, in modern history of native people, but like Dakota Access, I don't know what it was that something really opened up um, room for creating allies. And I, that's what LaDonna was always about, creating allies. It's not just about us, it's about everybody. So let's get everybody on board and quit alienating people. And let's get, you know, let's all work together. And because the more allies you have, the bigger voice you're going to have. Um, and so I think LaDonna was really, really, you know, she was very savvy about keeping those relationships, regardless if it's somebody, you know, you probably never in a million years would have been friends with, you know, um, getting those allies on board to actually create systemic change is critical. And I think, you know, I think, um, Dakota Access, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, all of those events um, in recent history has had an effect on, um, on not just documentary film, obviously, but you know, um, uh, feature films and TV series. Like we're we're finally getting, <laughs> we're finally getting some trust in the industry to say like, hey, there is an audience for this, and we also have talent. And we have a lot of really great untapped talent and we have a lot of incredible stories. So you're just going to see more and more, which is really exciting. I just, you know, I just hope this doesn't, the ride doesn't end <laughs> because I, I love seeing all of my, you know, fellow filmmakers finally getting to have their stories told on a national platform and international platform. Yeah. And kind of, um, off of that, we have one question submitted in advance by an audience member. This is from Barbara, and she's wondering, Juliana, what your next project is. Uh, next project, I'm, I'm actually working right now. Um, uh, I'm producing on a Ken Burns PBS documentary about the history of the Buffalo. It's a two part four hour series. Um, and um, I'm also making a short film um, about um, Buffalo uh, restoration programs within tribal communities. Um, and that will be online, you know, sort of to support the feature film. So that's what I'm doing this year. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Just thank you both so much. And now we'll turn back to Gwen who has some audience questions. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you so much. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Um, we really just had one kind of extension of, convert, of of questions and we're almost at our hour. So that, that works well. But if you do have any additional questions that we haven't covered, now's your time to put that those questions in the Q&A. Um, but kind of building on what you were just talking about, Juliana, about your next you know projects you're involved with right now, Holly was curious to know kind of personal impacts that this film had on you in, in your career and how you're using that to magnify uh, indigenous and native issues in your future films. So maybe if you wanna talk a little bit more about um, those upcoming projects. Yeah, um, you know, there's, I've been chatting with a few people um, about some projects. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, I love biographies and I love historical. Um, films. I also, you know, I love any social, you know, uh, uh, social kind of socially impactful film. So I've been in, in touch with several um, producers that um, have, have different projects in that in their own, but all around centered on native, uh, native people, native issues. But, you know, I'd like to work on something. Um, I'm hoping that one project, I can't mention who it is, but another female native leader um, that I'm really hoping uh, we can get made. 
um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of my, that's my passion. I'm, 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 I think magnifying those, those issues are, is, is critical. And, um, and then also the historical stuff is important too, because it, you know, again, we need context to everything that we're dealing with today um, to really understand, to get the full picture. So, so I like that, you know, in, in Indian 101, it is like, it is a really good kind of starting jumping off point, like to learn, you know, because LaDonna had to do that to, for the all the, you know, for all the US senators for years. <laughs> and, you know, now maybe some of these people can watch the film and have a little bit of a, <laughs> of a kickstart to like understand, you know, the basic issues um, that we're dealing with. And I think, you know, as I go on along in projects, I'm hoping to kind of pick up more pick up more things that can kind of build on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amaria and Isabella and True Kids One, Sandy there in the background for being our moderators today. I wanna to thank Juliana and Vernon for sharing all of their knowledge and their time and their expertise with us uh, today. Just as a reminder, you do have one more day to see the film. If you haven't yet had a chance, you can do that uh, on the Harwoods website. The link is in uh, the chat. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Vernon. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you all. Thank you all. It was really great talking with you. Thank you, Vernon. Have a good night. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Thank nice you. to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Bye-bye.